everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Up next on Another View, the first for our program, an all-female roundtable to share insight and perspective on issues facing the African-American community. Our pundits mix it up on Bill Cosby, Kanye West, doing anything while being black, and other social issues of today. Our guests include relationship expert Alvian Lyons, Norfolk City Treasurer Don Hester, public relations professional and owner of the Miles Agency, Delcino Miles, and comedian extraordinaire Allison Moore. It's going to be a great hour, everybody, so stay tuned. Another View is next. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Want to say hello out there to everybody. We are live on Facebook, so welcome to the show. And we are so excited about today's program. For the first time, we have assembled an all-female Another View (laughs) roundtable. Absolutely. So let's jump in it and meet our pundits. She's no stranger to Another View. We're happy to have back with us relationship expert Alvian Lyons. And guess what? She's about to debut her own (laughs) radio show this summer called the Lions Den. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that will be heard on uh, Hampton University Radio. Correct? Right. So okay. that'll be 88.1 yes. FM Absolutely. this summer. Yes, we're launching in July. We're very excited about it. <laughs> so I'll have to invite you guys on because it will be all about empowering women. So the show is for strong women and the men that love them. Oh, wow. So if you don't love strong women, this is not the show for you as a man. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm sure we will hear lots more about this as we go along. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Alvin. We appreciate that. This past November, voters in Norfolk chose Don Hester as their city treasurer. Yay! Hey there, Mr. Hey, city hey. treasurer. How are you? I am marvelous. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for We're me. excited to have you in here. She is the founder and owner of the Miles Agency, a niche marketing and PR agency in Virginia Beach, and absolutely no stranger to another view. Hey, Delcino. Hey there. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for being here today. Yep. Appreciate you. Yep. And you. You've been asking us, and we're finally delivering. We have a millennial Woo-hoo, on yay, the panel. Woo-hoo. Yay! <laughs> and she's a comedian also. Please welcome Ms. Allison Moore. Allison, Woo-hoo, how are you? you? Doing well, thank you. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. I know we've done a story on you before, so I'm anxious to hear your perspective. So, okay, ladies, let's get into it. Two weeks ago, Bill Cosby was convicted on three counts of aggravated indecent assault for drugging and sexually assaulting Andrea Constant. Bill's wife, Camille Cosby, said, and I quote, this is mob justice not real justice. This tragedy must be undone, not just for Bill Cosby, but for the country. Then she went on to compare Cosby to Emmett Till. Now, colleges and universities have pulled their honorary degrees from Cosby. Networks have removed reruns of the Cosby show. Lots of mixed emotions in the black community about his conviction. So, Alvin, let me start with you. What did you think when you heard the news and have his acts that he's been convicted of negated all the other work that he's done. It's a really tragic experience on multiple levels. You know, of course, as a woman, the tragedy in being violated, you know, and multiple women being violated. So there's no question about that. I mean, the facts speak for themselves, so to speak. You know, there we're not arguing any of those. So in and of itself, it is a tragedy of violation. But it seems like it has a secondary layer because you're talking about America's dad, who was America's African-American dad. He was the thing that many upwardly mobile African-American families would point to and say that we're like the Cosby family, you know, mm-hmm. like the Huxtables. Truly, mm-hmm. you know, like in and a lot of times they wouldn't even say the Hux, Huxtables. They would actually say the Cosby family instead because Bill Cosby was such an icon of the era, you know, so there's a piece of more that exists for the community of co- for our community of color because you're talking about yet again an experience of someone who's worked we're just talking about his body of work worked extremely hard was well respected w- crossed racial lines on so many different levels really was the example of what it meant to be a father and a committed husband and a professional and the list went on and on it looked fabulous and to lose that it stings a little bit. You know, you find yourself saying, okay, well, all right, we can no longer say we're like the Cosbys. We're the Obamas now. That's what we, that's what we are now. I saw you nodding your head. What do you think? Well, I mean, 
the Huxley Brothers were fictional. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a, it was somebody uh, in a script writing place, and they made it up. We have real Huxtables. I grew up in a family that was surrounded by love and support. Yeah, it's tragic, and it's and uh, I don't think I'm mourning so much. I think that um, we should all celebrate the families we come from. And as far as how Bill Cosby is being treated. Uh, at this point, he's a convicted felon right. and justice has been served. And I did take offense to uh, his situation being associated with Emmett Till. Absolutely. Uh, this was an innocent teenager who went down to Mississippi, did nothing wrong. And we find out years later that the woman lied. We all knew this, but she admitted it. And she's in her 80s, but she lived her life. And Emmett Till and his mother now, who's passed away, did, did not to get to grow up, to grow old. So I have a problem with her equating her husband's personal failings to a young teen who was innocently murdered behind a white woman's lie. Don Simbad said, um, the comedian Simbad says, said, okay, we get that he was convicted, but if you're going to take away all of his honorary degrees and you're going to stop the show, then why aren't these companies giving money to women's causes then in order to support? Why don't you take it the full way instead of just stripping him of what he has? What are your thoughts? Well, in this movement... Um, it's a movement of the women. It's not a movement of the corporate sector yet. And so until it infiltrates the corporate sector with training and understanding, I mean, we're still looking at NBC way back with Brokoff and all the others, you know, who are now being... Matt Lauer and... and right, and named like and blamed and all the way down the line. Um, the corporate structure has to change. Mm-hmm. And that's leadership at the corporate structure. And I don't think that's going to change until there are more women in leadership at the corporate structure. Mm. So I think that that's a part of it. Or as a part of the Me Too movement, you still have to give women who are working for someone um, freedoms or they have to um, feel that they can say what needs to be said and it will be investigated properly Mm. before you can even begin to still make those changes because things are still happening. You can't tell me that things aren't still happening. Mm. So, you know, they've happened, they might not have happened to anybody here, but they've happened to me. So, you know, until the culture changes, mm-hmm. it's going to continue. What do you think? Is, is this, Alvin said this was kind of a mourning period of a little bit for the black community. What do you think in terms of Cosby and who, what he represented? Well, you know, I'm not just going to say Cosby. I mean, you know, because, I mean, yeah, he, uh, you know, I admire him. Um, he did bad things. Yes. He's been convicted of those things. I'm not going to diminish the body of his work because he brought great joy. He has given a lot of his money to universities, his university and others. He has helped young people go to school. Um, And yes, um, even though it was a fictional um, story on television, it was one that was on television Mm -hmm. because other people didn't see what was in our houses. We knew what was in our homes. Mm -hmm. But it gave other audiences the opportunity to see that we like any other family. We try to be. We got the good, the bad, and the wealthy, and the poor, and everything else. And we just try to help raise our children and our families as best we can with what we have. And he was a model. Uh, the program was a model for that. Mm-hmm. And, Barbara, um, I don't see any of these universities giving those checks back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right, you can have the little degree, but nobody's giving back right. the millions of dollars that he and uh, Camille gave. Exactly. Nobody's offering nobody, that back. Nobody's offering And that. even yeah, all the yeah, artwork. Oh, yeah. You know, he yeah. has a great art collection, collection that's sure in museums all around you know mm-hmm. so i'm moving them out not showing them anymore but it just depends on, on. Right. allison you're the young one on the group what do you think because i hear a difference in the in in a little bit generationally too because of people who kind of grew up with cosby as opposed to people who learned about him later on and, and more in this context as opposed to um his context in terms of doing good work on tv and 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 performing and so forth well um if i'm speaking on behalf of my generation i think we're pretty disgusted Mm -hmm. um and then for the millennials we also especially um those who are in the urban family so to speak we already were kind of figuring out how we felt about r kelly Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we're already like, well, do we do we listen to R. Kelly music anymore? <laughs> like, hey, do we do we still? <laughs> For our audience, tell them about R. For Kelly. For our audience, 
Um, so R. Kelly is an R&B singer, very big, popular R&B singer who had a whole lot of hits. And so I'm 35, just had a birthday, by the way. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> you surprised. I look 16. Say it. Say it. Say it. 16 years older than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. There you go. So, you know, we already had that place of, you know, when I was in high school and then college, R. Kelly was coming out with some major hits. That was just what we, in hip hop or, you know, R&B, we loved. And so then he had this string, this history of violating young girls and taking advantage of women. And even right now, maybe an alleged prison of women who are just kind of brainwashed and so we were already in that place of having to make the decision where do you stand if there's this repeated offender or you know situation and so then when Bill Cosby comes so it wasn't really our first time collectively trying to decide we don't like this or do we like this or do we still support the art or do we not where do we stand we're kind of like okay here go another one all right guys we need to make a decision are we playing it at the movies? I mean, excuse me, at the parties. Are we watching Bill Cosby on the reruns or not? And so um, it, it's disappointing because he was for especially those of us who are fatherless or didn't have men that represented good role, role models, male role models, black men. We we're like, oh, dang. you know, it, mm-hmm. it's it's a weird place to be, but it is not where we're crippled, so to speak. I don't think that we're mourning I think that it is frustrating for those who've had the conversations with the aunties and the grandmas who were like oh those white women just coming off to Bill Cosby Monday we're like okay what about now this yeah. is women 46 <laughs> and they all ain't black so grandma how, you know so so the question first of all the question to you is what did you decide do you play R. Kelly's music or not um, <laughs> I decided not to play R. Kelly's movie, but, music but I ain't gonna lie at my birthday party we did slip in one song <laughs> Step in the name of love, and I was torn. I was conflicted. <laughs> I should not be enjoying this, but this was my song. So it's hard <laughs> to, you know, you have memories attached to somebody's artwork or what they experienced, but then it's at the same time you don't want to. I mean, you're looking at the person. It's a real place because you know I, I'm a comedian, and so I produce um, shows. I have a web series that we just produced, mm-hmm. and I'm not perfect. Now I'm not out here slipping stuff in people's drinks and taking advantage of me either. <laughs> my imperfections you are sure? a little like I ain't cleaning my kitchen positive <laughs> but I you know to be an artist like well dang on if you know my skeletons came out not comparing my skeletons to these but how would I feel if somebody was like oh we don't like her and throw the whole throw the whole painting away it's just this weird yeah. space but I'm not I'm definitely not giving my money I'm definitely not continue to perpetuate my viewership like I don't want to appear to support and um, I'm still in like a weird place on what to do I think that's probably true about everybody so is anybody watching to see whatever what happens next in terms of like who's next to um, is is Harvey Weinstein for example going to ever wind up in a courtroom Um, others who have been accused of the same crimes does that matter it matters ahead, to me. Does matter. It matters to me, but we don't know what the court system will do. We don't know what the victims will do. Right. So you know, if 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 they're going to press it forward and try to bring it to court, and then how much are you willing to pay? You know, some mm-hmm. people will pay to have it go away. Bill wanted uh, Cosby challenged it. Right. He yeah. wanted to go to court. He wanted his day in court. Mm-hmm. And when you have your day in court, things going to turn out different than if you going to pay somebody. Sure. To make it go away. Do you guys think that they will send him to prison? Just out of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Don't see that? Uh, I do. Mm-hmm. You do? I do. I think they're going to follow through with it um, because a lot of folks feel, I think, the political pressure, the pressure in the media. Yeah. And he was convicted. So it may not be as harsh as some want because I think it was 10 years per, per, per so, which convicted. is a life right. sentence mm-hmm. for an 80-year-old man. I think they'll give account to his body of work. I think they'll give account to his age. And those kinds of things. But I, I do believe he's going to um, spend some time behind bars. Um, yeah. And I just think for those victims, he should spend some time behind bars because he did do something wrong. He was a uh, jury uh, did convict him. So it wasn't mob justice, as his right. wife said. It wasn't. It was 12 people mm-hmm. who uh, deliberated and it wasn't quick. It wasn't as quick as O.J. 
uh, what, 45 minutes. But this was, this took some time. They deliberated and looked at it, and were able to separate the Cliff Huxtable from the man who played him, Bill right. William H. Cosby, Jr. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Last word? No, I, oh, just, I think it's always, for us as a, a community of color, it's always interesting to see whether or not there's universality in the way in which we approach justice. So I, we have no issue with wrongdoing and the consequences associated with wrongdoing. What's always interesting to watch is whether or not that equates across the board or similarly when someone else has similar offenses. Mm -hmm. That will be interesting to watch. How does the nation respond to a Harvey Weinstein as opposed to a Bill Cosby? While the merits of the case are slightly different, just to be accurate, those are slightly different. Still, in terms of the court of public opinion and how we castigate, how we chastise, how we demonize, are we going to do the same thing consistently? And will there be a Harvey Weinstein comeback a couple of years from now and America suddenly has amnesia about what he did, but America has been in pursuit of Bill Cosby for years now. So this is not the first time that this has surfaced in the media, but this is the first time we're actually getting an official conviction. And and to our millennial, even though we're only just a few years apart, <laughs> As far as the the whole, you know, R. Kelly thing is concerned, sometimes you, you have to draw a line in the sand for us. And as women, I I do not listen to his music. The minute the stuff came out about him, the young, that was it yeah. for me. So, so it, it was an age thing for you more so than, than a woman thing? Yeah, you know. I think adult women have the right to make the decisions they make, even if I don't agree with them, even if I question where was your mama and your daddy your whole life. You know, like I just that you have the right to make horrible decisions for yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about predatory behavior and you're an adult man with young girls, that is a different playing field. And that for me is a non-negotiable and there is no room to discuss Mm -hmm. what qualities you had in any other aspect of your life. Interesting. Well, ladies, let's move on to our next topic because we got four really hot topics to talk about today. So, Kanye West. (laughs) Dear Kanye, uh, stirred up things over the past few weeks, ranting on social media about his pro-Trump stance Mm. and calling slavery in America a choice. On TMZ Live, he said, when you hear about slavery for 400 years, for 400 years, that sounds like a choice. Mm -hmm. Twitter went crazy. Dulcino, are we paying too much attention to these celebrity rants, thoughts? Yes. Or is he dangerous? Well, well, no, I don't think anybody's believing him. I don't think he has a whole lot of credibility. But, um, yeah, I think the man just needs to probably have be diagnosed with something. I think there's something wrong with him because uh, either that or he's a great PR guy. Um, because a lot of it is, is just nonsense. Slavery is a choice. For whom? Um, and then he tried to backpedal a little bit, I think a day or two later, yeah. mm-hmm. saying that that's not what he meant. It was about the mindset. Um, regardless, it's a careless, reckless statement. Uh, I don't believe a lot of people are paying attention. However, they're buying his music. We're back to that drawing the line, right? Um, so I don't listen to Kanye. Um, I don't. I don't watch the Kardashians or any of that stuff because it's foolishness. And uh, I think he's just feeding into a very hungry media. Uh, and uh, with the onset of so much uh, accessibility to these stars now, with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, they just put anything out there and people continue to follow them. I don't follow Kanye West or anybody of that ilk uh, that has that kind of ignorance and spews that kind of ignorance. So I'm a thinking short of in some sort of, we have our counselor here, of a diagnosis <laughs> of medication uh, needs to be uh, redone. Uh, I just, I don't give it much credence. And the fact that we're giving him airtime now is probably what he's looking for. Because doesn't he have yeah. an album about to drop? He That's has, usually he when has, he, he says these crazy two, things. He says, and then he's uh, apparently dropped, well, he has an album about to drop and he's dropped two songs So already. I don't think it's a coincidence. So, so you don't think it's a coincidence no, at, no. at all? Alvin? I think that This is where the generational lines start to become an issue also, because we have a generation that is absolutely raised by pop culture. Mm -hmm. So it does matter what 
people in positions of uh, celebrity, so to speak, or, um, you know, fame do when you have the absenteeism of real parenting going on, Mm -hmm. when you don't have real mentorship inside of your home, when you don't have positive role models to be able to look at, connect with, when those things aren't real for you in your personal life, then there is a great deal more credence paid to these other individuals. So then there's a level of accountability that comes with that. And while they did not sign up to raise America, and Kanye is not anybody's daddy except for Saint and Northwest or Northeast or South or whatever the child's <laughs> name is, you know, like the <laughs> yes, that's true. We, North, South, East, okay, West, whatever yeah. that is, right? But the fact that he is speaking out of, as America referred to, the sunken place right now. Okay, everything that is coming out of that man's mouth makes you wonder. If you look at some of his interviews on Ellen DeGeneres, I mean, there there is unequivocally a problem going on with him. With him. Unequivocally a problem. So I would totally agree with you that something is remaining undiagnosed, and some people would call it genius, others would call it psychosis, but you know, you pick your word. The reality, though, is that he has millions and millions of followers and they will clap for anything and they ingest it as if it were vitamins into their life. I mean, we we have to be mindful of what's being said, especially if people are not counteracting that narrative in some informed fashion. Allison, and I'll come back to you, Don. Allison, what do you Mm -hmm. think? I think that um, a lot of hip hop, pop culture, they are not accepting Kanye's stance right now. Now, I don't, mm. you know, prior to three weeks and back, maybe so. But, you know, he, Breakfast Club, a lot of people are covering it and very upset with it, right. what he's saying. A lot of celebrities are coming out. I've, I've seen like five, six, you know, Eve and T.I. He and T.I. had a, um, th- th- one of the songs that he dropped is the rapper T.I. and himself. And T.I. was in great opposition of what he was saying. I mean, he's like trying to explain this is how I feel about it. And T.I. was like, dude, you you going about this the wrong way. So a lot of people are really pushing back, which to me, um, I'm really happy and excited about that because it's making the younger generation say, okay, well, it's not just a, oh, we all go for Kanye. Like they are seeing people, other people that they um, deem as celebrities and people that they look up to saying, no, we're not with this one. And it's making them have to make a decision as opposed to just, okay, you, you like this deal with it you know people are being held accountable i think that that you're seeing that with this Kanye situation everybody's not happy about it everybody's not happy about it Don. i just want to say that i thought uh, it makes all of us think mm-hmm. about who we're listening to mm-hmm. and what they're saying to mm-hmm. us and then also figuring out what's the truth and what's not mm-hmm. because we've been dealing with that with this new um administration mm-hmm. that we have and so because we know that there's so much misinformation in the community mm-hmm. that, I mean, not just our community, black community, Everybody, across the, the world, whole, across the world, across yeah. the world, right. mm-hmm. then I, I think that the pushback um, to Kanye has helped us to think. And, you know, if we, if, if we don't read and pay, do things for ourselves, then we're going to believe what we hear. Absolutely. Until somebody else puts something else in our ear that we respect that helps us to go, right. okay, well, maybe that's not right. To counter that. And there are a lot of people that don't, young people, excuse me, I'm just saying it because I'm old, but <laughs> that really don't know the history and well, how, I think that's what's and so how bad it was. And then, yeah. and then um, you know, when, when you have a love of history, because then it helps you to grow to who you are, but then when you don't know mm-hmm. history or depth and depth history, then you do make some decisions and do some things that you think are okay um, mm-hmm. that are not okay. And when people of color do things that are not okay and other people do things that are not okay, it's the people of color that are always hurt more Often. by those decisions mm-hmm. that they make. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm glad people are thinking, you know, I thought D.L. Hughley did a great job when, you know, he talked about um, choice. And we all have choice, and I think that that's a part of what we need to make in the conversation. You have a choice of who you listen to. You need to pay attention to who you're listening to, Mm -hmm. and you need to pay attention to what's being said. Because, yes, I don't know if Kanye's on a song or not, because I don't know who's doing any of the (laughs) pop culture stuff. You know, because I I don't listen to it. I'm like, I don't know the words, can't figure out the words. You know, I know if I like the beat. That's all I know. 
And I'm not going to look into it to see what's in the word. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, oftentimes I just cut it off, but that's just me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a lot of my generation do that. So, you know, we might be bebopping to a song that is not that's saying, saying right. what we want really it to be want saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. You know, so you can't even bebop like you used to. <laughs> and it's Allison is looking at us like, oh, my goodness. I can't believe you guys. <laughs> but you understand that, right? Yeah, I, I do understand that. Um, you know, now, I, I will share with you, I'm definitely a millennial slash other things you know my my <laughs> I, I, didn't want, I didn't want to say that your choice is just one way yeah it's i didn't want to say okay, okay. right okay right. So it is. No, no. i'm old school so i play let bid with let me let me clarify let me let she said it right play bid with and she said it right and she said it right with a team <laughs> and pinochle okay. right. so i'm you know okay i qualify okay. you qualify for what you go i you didn't you i went to hbcu okay but i'm just and i went to a non-hbcu too does that does that count? Uh, I did too. So okay. You're multidimensional. Yeah, too. Thank you. <laughs> and old. Okay. Well, we'll, and, and old. Listen, and so, and thanks for clarifying yeah. that for if, me because I didn't want to say that you all. Oh, auntie. I didn't want to say it was all in, in one venue. But you know, y'all know the word. <laughs> if you're just joining us, we're talking about the hashtag Me Too and other are social issues. We are in a little bit uh, with our all-female Another Few Roundtable, relationship expert Alvian Lyons, Norfolk City Treasurer Don Hester, public relational, relations professional professional Delcino Miles and comedian Allison Moore. Yay. So <laughs> you ladies are something else. Okay. So. so here's the thing. So the latest is a black Yale student who fell mm. asleep in the common area of her dorm. Mm. A white student called the police. This habit of calling the police on African Americans who are not breaking the law started with Philadelphia with the manager of the Starbucks store who called the police because two African American men were waiting for a third person for a meeting, had not ordered anything. Police handcuffed the men, escorted them out. Patrons were outraged and recorded the activity and it went viral. Five women at a Pennsylvania golf course had the police called on them because they were playing too slow. A neighbor called the police on two African American women who were packing their car after a stay at an Airbnb and then two Native American students who went to the University of Colorado, their dream school to take the tour and a woman on the tour said they were creepy kids and made her uncomfortable and called the police. What is going on with this calling the police thing on people who are not breaking the law? Don, I'm going to start with you on this one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's because we don't know each other and we don't get to know each other. I, You know, I can't, I can't explain it. I can't explain other people's actions because I don't understand their views. I don't understand how they were raised. I don't understand why they're scared. I have never been scared of anybody. And maybe that's because of how I was raised. Okay. okay. So that, you know, has some. And because, maybe because in my growing up, I was around everybody, every color, every shade, every race, every religion and everything. So, you know, I I don't understand why we are afraid the of woman, each other. The woman who called, uh, the student who called the police on the African-American student at Yale said, um, and they have her on tape saying, you know, I had every right to call the police because she's not supposed to sleep there. And my thing is, she in the same building you in. You in never the, saw her before? To know that she's next door? or But or I mean, all of us have gone to and, university or colleges and universities. I stayed in the dorm, I assume. I didn't go to that one. Well, okay, but, but <laughs> my, my point is, you fall asleep everywhere when it's exam time. What is... I never Delcino, knew. Let me hear from you. I never knew it was a rule. <laughs> Barbara, it, bigotry never went away. We have laws on the books, but uh, there's still bigotry out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Why, again, social media is sort of exacerbating it and because there are, none of this stuff is new. It, it didn't stop happening. It's just right. that where everybody has a, a smartphone and they can record it and it goes viral. We mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have heard of this Starbucks incident uh, 20 years ago. Um, so it's a, it's a condition of the heart. This this is a country we still haven't gotten over um, the the vestiges and cruelty of slavery and civil rights and Jim Crow and all those things. Uh, I'd like to think that our generation is teaching the next generation 
uh, better, mm -hmm. getting to know. I grew up, uh, I went to a predominantly white high school and college, and so I learned how to get to know people. I like to get to know people. I don't judge them based on anything. Uh, except, you know, maybe except how they treat it, you. It, how, yeah. So and uh, but it's a heart issue. I think it's uh, this country seems to be angry and I'm not sure why. Um, and, it, and it goes on both sides. Uh, we have. <laughs> Come on. Why are we angry? <laughs> why are we angry? I mean, what are we angry about? We, we keep okay, bragging. Don't say we, keep, we angry. No, we as Americans, this country, okay, we live Americans, here. Okay, Americans. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Well, some uh, of them are angry because there's more people of color around. Well, yeah, the browning of America is happening. It's okay, an that's, issue for some people. That's, it's an issue it's for, some, for some. But usually people, people are angry out of uh, whether that somebody did something to them or they mm. think they're going to do something to them out of fear or uh, uh, out of out of fear of losing something. Uh, in this case, with the browning of America, that kind of speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the fact that the I know Barbara, you've talked many times about uh, white privilege, those issues that maybe maybe some feel threatened that that's that privilege is slipping, away. slipping away. So okay. I think it's a lot of things, but the anger and the quick quick to put up use the police as your as sort of. You're bullying someone through law enforcement. I have an issue with that. Why couldn't the lady, especially with the Airbnb, just just go over there and just say, hi, how are you doing? Because she's uh, scared. Again, <laughs> but the point is, why? Would yeah. she have made that call if those women were not of color? You know the answer to the question. What are you asking? <laughs> I'm talking to her viewers, Facebook people out there. I'm sorry. Okay, I know you all, and you don't use all this stuff. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's Albia, it is. Albia, what do you think? So I do I find it interesting that they keep calling <laughs> the police, it. and I don't think yeah. it's accidental in yeah. any form or fashion. It's kind. Of, it's not very different than when people say to you, um, you know, someone so and so was talking badly to you about me. What made them think that it was appropriate to have a conversation with you about me? Mm -hmm. So before I even have an issue with them, why do they think you were the right person to have that dirty conversation about me? Well, the question then is, why do people believe that the police are the right people to call when something like this happens? Mm -hmm. And what I would argue is that the issue is the word prejudice. But let's take prejudice and let's recognize that the call to the police is because people are desiring pre justice. What they want is for their prejudice to be able to be dealt with in a way that there is someone who is going to ensure the outcome that they're looking for. They want, Without them having to do it. Without them having to do it. I want you to be the executor of my agenda and I believe you to be the right entity to do that very thing. There is a reason why in America now they believe the police to be capable of doing and willing to do their dirty work. And that for me is the thing that is more concerning. Because if you believe that the, the boys in blue are the answer to your racism, then that says to me that we are not doing a good job where our law enforcement is concerned mm -hmm. of making it crystal clear that we are here to implement justice, Well, what about not this racism. also? Do you think that, that also there's a psychological thing that happens when police are called on black people. Oh, of course. I mean, it just is because mm -hmm. because of the experiences the and the history, the history behind that. It. And right. so this whole idea, and Allison, I want to hear from you because I'm, I'm really curious as to how you all are processing this whole idea of somebody just looking at you. I mean, because in essence, that's what happens in each one of these instances. Absolutely. Someone looked at the people, saw they were of color, didn't like what they were doing, mm -hmm and call the police. So I, I want to make sure, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Allison okay. Okay, with this mm -hmm. next one. Um, I, I get it. You know, she saw something that made her afraid. She saw something she was not comfortable with. That in, that in itself doesn't bother me. The thing that bothers me is the fact that the police responded. You know, if somebody wanted... I remember we were in high school and, we, and it was this really big thing. I went to a predominantly black high school and I remember when this is how the narrative was for us. The white kids were wearing all black and they were going into shooting up schools. That's how it was given to us. So when we would see oh, a white like kid... When you're talking about things like um, Columbine, Columbine. Columbine yes, and absolutely. so forth. Okay. So that was, for me, okay. that was my middle school. That was my high school. So okay. when we would see white kids with a trench coat on, we were like, oh. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> call the police. So because of that, we didn't think call the police because we didn't think the police necessarily were on our side, whereas white people mm-hmm. may do. Mm-hmm. Do, however, I get that piece. I get, oh, shoot, she, because media is filling you with black people are dangerous, black people are whatever. So I understand that's how she felt she wanted to call the police. But it would be fixed if the police weren't like at Starbucks you want to call the cops on the black boy call the cops but the cops why are you escorting them out like that is where it it just that's where it hurts you know I I had a friend um, I was just talking to him three days ago he's a, a comedian and he's a clean comedian he's doing comedy in a church and has a bag of product um, like a duffel bag and it has his CDs his shirts his product mm-hmm. and one of the women at the church called security he was a black man it was a predominantly white church mm-hmm. and he was a black man with product and she was like oh. and later I guess kind of confessed her sins well we ain't know about you so we called the co- mm-hmm. wow that in itself I, I'm giving her all kinds of side eye but security did not respond to that which made me feel way better had security respond to it I'm like okay here we go again and this is why they're being empowered because of the response it's like oh I don't like that black person I think they're, with, I think they're gonna steal something I'm gonna call the cops and now cop has the authority so to speak to empower their narrative or empower right. how they feel about us right. and or mm-hmm. shut it down like ma'am don't call me again <laughs> with this lady that lived probably two doors down for you like this but, but cops right. are not doing that and so it makes me afraid it makes mm-hmm. me very disheartened it, it you know it clouds me with hopelessness or whatever when it's like dang this is how they're going to respond to complaints i i could be anywhere and i don't want nobody to feel like you know she about to shoot something up because i had many opportunities if i wanted to i would have been did it before now <laughs> <laughs> allison <laughs> okay but the point allison allison <laughs> <laughs> but we get we get your point. You would not do that. Right. Those, okay, allowed. please Allegedly. clarify that for the group. <laughs> for the Allegedly. For the group. You say but quickly. But but my point oh, go ahead. No. Oh, okay. But my point also is how do we get it's a point that you made, Don. How do we get people not to call the cops in the first place? I guess I'm getting back to that heart thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do we need to do to because the country is browning and things are changing and we've got to bring people along, mm. I guess. Um, although everybody, I think, is kind of struggling to just make it on a day to day basis. And now we have this extra drama. Mm-hmm. But now it's we, always been there. Okay, go ahead, Dawn. No, 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 it's, it's, it's always been there. It, it, yeah. The struggle, the bigotry, the fear, hopelessness, it has all. It, it's just in a different form it's, now because we have social media and it's social so media the, helps to get the message out. Mm-hmm. Um, social, so this medium will help us to uh, get it to hopefully a better place mm-hmm. where the training, the conversations, the working on my heart and your heart and everybody else's heart to be, I'm human just like you, bleed just like, you know, that mm-hmm. conversation we always have, but just talk to me. Just tell me what it is that is um, that causes you to challenge thing. me. But if 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 you fear me, you're not gonna talk to me. So mm-hmm. somebody else has to bring right. bring the two and together. It's not even fear; it's hate. They they well, grew up hating. It. They grew up hating our skin color. Yeah. Uh, what Dylan Roof? He he chose this church and shot up what nine people? Nine people. He That's murdered right. nine people because they were black. That's he right. planned this ahead. Right. And what is he in his twenties? Right. Mm-hmm. And so now, so that's hate in a church. Even my church, our security checks our bags when we come and in they, church. Yeah. And they wow. know I'm a member of the church. Mm. But if we do it for everybody, because you don't know that day when somebody mm-hmm. of whatever color mm-hmm. may come in and want to do something in the church. Yeah. So I appreciate that because I want to go in church and know that I can get my church on and not have to worry about somebody else doing mm-hmm. something that's right we have our security process in place so we know what to do when bishop when, tells us to do something we know where to go so you've had drills and so forth yes, in the church we've wow. been taught because yeah. you don't know it's a different world we've had training for other churches just had one at our mm-hmm. church for mm-hmm. other security mm-hmm. church you know members of the speaking church speaking of so, training alvin i want to ask you this uh shutdown of starbucks on the 29th of of may is this going to make a difference <laughs> For training well, you know. and for bias. I mean, I guess this whole idea of all of a sudden we have to train people to not, not be to racist. Be, to not be racist. <laughs> I mean, I, 
It's, right. It's optics. No, what I find, I I find literally comical in all of this is that you believe in one day you're going to fix 400 years worth of racism in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's impressive. I mean, I know a Starbucks makes a good cup of coffee, but you make <laughs> if I you could fix racism, strong, yeah. you could fix racism in one day. Now, Starbucks is really impressive then. I mean, like I just I, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I appreciate the effort. I appreciate the fact that it is going to have a financial impact for the store for that day. I recognize that they are trying to do something. So I give you credit on the try. Mm-hmm. I really I do give you credit on the try. But racism is such a significant thing that exists within our community. And I have to be honest with you. You know, I spend a lot of time doing work with churches, a lot of time. And I actually lay a lot of this at the feet of the white evangelical church. And let me tell you why. Because if you have not been able to take your love of God and the relationship with your brother to the place where it has practical application in terms of your brown neighbor or your not vanilla wasp neighbor, if you are, have not been able to take your love and your message to that place, you have failed your responsibility. Because we are, if we in fact are supposed to be brothers and sisters in faith, then that should be, and we know it's a national crisis, that should be something that is part of your duty as a believer. And it does not make it into conversation. Most, you would be lucky to find 7% of white evangelical America who even knows who Tamir Rice is. Who knows who Freddie Gray is? Who knows mm-hmm. who Alton Sterling is? Mm-hmm. It's not Philando mm-hmm. Castile. It's not even on the radar inside of these churches. And the responsibility, you want to go to Africa and feed the starving children, and God bless you for doing so. But we have a moral depravity that exists in our nation. We are starving love in our own nation. You can do your outreach ministry right here You know, it's in interesting. ways like that. There was an article in uh, the New York Times. They did a, um, a piece on the fact that African Americans who have been joining um, predominantly white mega churches mm-hmm. are, are leaving mass in exodus. droves Absolutely. because church, there's were no discussion mm-hmm. within these churches about the issues mm-hmm. that face this group of people in their, in their congregation. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and they're even chastised for bringing it up as troublemakers inside of the church, the people of color who want to bring that into the conversation. It's seen as divisive. So my pain doesn't count, but everybody else's pain matters. Mm-hmm. That is where the problem begins to happen. And the willful silence about the violence, emotional violence happening in America is a scary experience. It's deafening for many people of color who are members inside of these churches mm-hmm. so thoughts i thought you you'd be shaking your head i, thought I, you I, to add I, to I agree with her uh-huh. uh, the, the church is condone condone for slavery. years <laughs> and um uh, many mm-hmm. of the uh folks under the sheets were leaders in the church that's exactly they right were. historically so, i agree mm-hmm. with her they mm-hmm. were. so is there anything what can we do about it and uh, is there anything <laughs> we can do about it in terms of this whole turning around this this um trend of picking up the phone and calling the police instead of, like you said, Don, just talking to each other. I mean, what do we say to people? Is that, do we, how do we have that conversation? Well, just like we're having it now. Right. But the room has to have, say, different faces. Four other faces in <laughs> Right. <laughs> that would help yeah. with, you know, how we feel, um, why we feel the way we do, what experience did I have that caused me to think like I do or respond like I do. Mm -hmm. Because even if you haven't had an experience with a person of color, if that's all you've heard growing up, then that's your experience. Mm -hmm. And so you're just going to take that whatever out into the the world or workplace or what have you, Mm -hmm. and then you begin to, you know, you you perpetuate what you've been taught. Um, But with the church, it's not Christ-like. We know that in every church, Mm -hmm. you're not taught the same thing. Yeah. But the word is the same, yeah. period. And you read and mm-hmm. interpret the word differently because it is done that way. Then you, you know, well, and that's been done all through all, all through, through history. Right. Mm-hmm. So then, so there, nothing yeah. has changed. Mm-hmm. So nothing has changed. 
So the last thing I want to bring up, um, I, if you guys have been watching mainstream media commercials lately, and I'm coming to you, Alvia, because <laughs> I know you have something to say about this. Any, and these are commercials that have couples yeah. in them, okay? Mm-hmm. If you noticed lately <laughs> that the couples are usually now more and more interracial. Yes, they are. Okay. Yeah, I've seen it. We're making progress. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Except that the... Man, the female is usually African American, mm-hmm. and the male is white. Mm-hmm. So, are we subtly again <laughs> eliminating our brothers, Alvian, <laughs> Miss Ac- Miss Relationship Expert? What's well, I, going on I have here? To say that I honestly have noticed a very interesting trend since Scandal. Carrie Washington huh. has effectively made brown women the ultimate accessory of powerful white men. So the conversation comes up all of the time. I cannot tell you how many of these conversations I have in various format because you're talking about a show where a black woman and, you know, I prefer chocolate and vanilla. But for the sake of this conversation, I will say black. Please, because you drive my my listeners crazy when you say (laughs) vanilla and chocolate. You know, I I think that everybody should be a dessert. Okay, but the you're talking about a show where a black woman who was the mistress made the white wife, who is the first lady of the United States, play second. Like how that managed to happen and America vote for, I mean, cheer for the black mistress of the white president. And the white wife was in support of team, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was a trend that was beginning there that if you watch when scandal really started to hit its height that a lot of the media commercials started to change right along with it so cheerios was not of course you yeah, remember, remember when that che- happened cheerios came out and and just for those who don't remember mm-hmm. there was an african american male and a white woman right. and the world blew up i mean oh, they were just so incensed yeah. by this commercial absolutely Amazing. but america has never had a problem with white men in positions of dominance with black women mm-hmm. they've never had a problem with that because that matches our historical context that matches slavery okay mm-hmm. and while i am not in any form or fashion suggesting at all that women who choose to date multiculturally you sure. know my family is multicultural that that is not the issue if you love each other and love each other's culture also mm-hmm. because i think that's another factor does he love you or does he love the culture that you're a part of mm-hmm. those end up in very different outcomes in relationship so if you have someone who genuinely loves you and your culture there is a richness that can exist inside of that that is wonderfully healthy but what we're seeing right now is america attempting to embrace diversity but they still want to embrace it in a way that is historically comfortable for america you are not seeing a bunch of brown men with white women on these commercials not at all you are seeing the exact (laughs) opposite so i find it interesting that we've chosen particular patterns of comfort but if we watch the trajectory you could almost tie it back to a huge rise after scandal rose well you know it's going to go up even more now because uh the wedding that's coming up over in england absolutely uh the mother-in-law megan harry yeah megan markle no offense (laughs) (laughs) but i mean but look at all the dialogue around that situation prince harry choosing someone that's totally different and all the Mm -hmm. and it and we've already seen folks who having issues with that Absolutely. and having problems with that. But I just admire the fact that he loves her and her family. Truly. And then there's yes. no doubt. Mm-hmm. And she has embraced her own culture. She has not hidden anything. And mm-hmm. she's very proud. And matter of fact, her, her mother's there helping her. But mm-hmm. with uh, Meghan Markle, I think that's a turning point for not only just a, just black white relationships, but just the, that monarchy in general, because it, 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 th- that was the standard. Right. You do things this way, you do things that way, you don't stray from and the... He's, he's that's come right. out of that he box. Has busted he that, busted like, the box completely Oh, that open. mold is broken. <laughs> I'm glad he did, but we also know that he had a mother, yes, who true. taught her <laughs> sons for that absolutely to, right. to love, love everybody, you know. Right. So, so that yeah. that you had that to does put help. that in there. So, you know, Diana broke that barrier. Mm-hmm. Sure did. But comfort, I don't know. Comfort is is okay, but I think it's control because media still controls the mind, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I still think it's a, con- a, a controlling factor that somebody behind that camera knows exactly what they're doing and they're still trying to keep it 
the way they want it kept. Yeah, that's it. Concerns me in terms of what it, what it says about our black men. I mean that. In to what me, way? It just, what, what does it in say? What, way? what does in, it say? In, in, just in the sense to me that they're being erased. And when well, you look, when you're looking at, but if you at think the, about the statistics, Barbara, mm-hmm. the reality is for upwardly mobile African American women. I know. You know, I know the statistics. I know the statistics. Only forty-two percent of them ever get a chance to get married. Forty-two percent, and that was a couple years ago. We don't even know what it looks like now. Mm-hmm. So, for black women who want a partner, and most not, of I'm, them are forced to consider. And I agree with you. My sister, my that. my sister is in an interracial relationship. I mean, it's Mine in our family, too. you know, and so <laughs> forth. But. You know, when you when you're talking about how, uh, Dawn, when you say media affects um, perceptions Mm -hmm. and so forth, Mm -hmm. again, when we don't see strong black men in any kinds of positive Mm -hmm. roles, Mm -hmm. this is to me just one other role that's just not there. But I want to hear from Allison because we only got three minutes left. (laughs) No pressure. I I, I do think that there is. Like to answer your question, how do we fix? And there was another question about how do we fix it? I think that it, everybody does their part in their sphere or their mountain or their sector. Right. So like me, I've taken their personal. OK, well, Allison, if you're going to produce content or if you have an audience of 100 or 600 people that you're making laugh or entertaining, then why don't you put some narratives out that paint you or represent you and those in whom are behind you in a light in which, oh, maybe they're not so bad or intimidating Mm -hmm. or you know if I'm putting out content I'm writing and I'm producing shows and it need to be one in which don't just look at the Cosby where you know they're 200 and 300,000 dollar income families they are middle class or lower class we I promise you we're not violent or we're not someone to be feared or hated and just you know you're where you are in your sphere if you're representing your people I think that that helps to make someone else realize, oh man, I got this really wrong. Um, and, and I'm in agreement with what you say with with the black men and the white woman thing. Mm-hmm. I think it is a situation the white men don't want to see their prized possession by a black man. To me, mm-hmm. with a black man. I mean, I think white women are still trophies. They're still considered the best, the most valuable. And so to put them with a black man, like maybe not so much, but black women with white men, okay, yeah, because you can add to it. Um, and that's my... 22nd bit of thought (laughs) trying to get it in not necessarily painted out as detailed or colorful as I'd like to but I think that there is some element of control there but it is also who's who's the right not necessarily who's behind the camera but who's the director who's writing and so writers like Ava DuVernay and black women who now I'm casting and I'm putting out my story and it's entertaining and it's making money then they have the power to at least from their sphere their little piece that's not politics that's not over here hospital or education you got to do your part in your office but at least in that one that's the suggestion for me. Ladies, I cannot believe we are out of time. <laughs> Finally, I, I have to tell you this. Lisa sent me a note. My producer, Lisa Godley, says, callers are saying this is better than our regular round table. Of course it is. <laughs> Thank you, talented producer Lisa Godley, Yay, who pulled listening. this together. Yeah, Yay, Lisa. Lisa. Absolutely. For our guest as Alvian Lyons, relationship expert, thank you so very much. My pleasure. City Treasurer Don Hester, thank you so very much. You're welcome. We're going to have to Let's do this do again. again. You know we yeah. will. <laughs> Delcino Miles, owner of the Miles One Agency. One show contract. That's now, it. we're bringing you back. And comedian <laughs> Allison Moore, Woo-hoo. thank you so very, very much. And thank that's you. it for this edition of Another View. If you'd like to hear the show again or share it with a friend, visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast and while you're there please sign up for our eview newsletter it's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows now next week it's an another view history lesson about journalist civil rights activist and women's rights activist lucille bluford and the role of the black press in those movements it's a fascinating story and i uh, hope you will tune in to listen to that so our theme music was composed and performed by jay senate lisa godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer and Kamari Mason's in there even though we didn't have any phone calls. <laughs> Ladies, thanks again for joining us. Thank you on Facebook Live. We really appreciate you being here. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you so very, very much for listening to Another View. <laughs> <laughs>